please welcome to the stage Organic Produce Summit President, Susan Canales. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to our home here in beautiful Monterey. We are so excited to be here. If you were in educational sessions this morning, you heard things like sustainability, CEA, regenerative. And while those terms aren't necessarily new, what it means is our industry continues to evolve and change, and we are thrilled that you see OPS as a source of information and education. To our sponsors and our exhibitors, thank you for your continued support. To our retail attendees, Thank you for being here, taking time out of your schedule. And we, we ask that you try to visit as many booths as possible to see the amazing products our exhibitors have to offer. And now with insight into how we can save the planet and help people, how we can reach consumers across all media channels, and finally, what the future of grocery retailing might look like, we present to you the OPS 2022 keynote presentations. Organic Produce Summit would like to thank its co-sponsor, Earthbound Farm. We are proud to grow and pack the finest organic greens, now in bold new packaging. Our innovative peel and reseal clamshell reduces plastic by up to 35%. We are proud to sequester carbon with organic and regenerative farming practices while still providing assured supply of our products when you need them. We are proud to offer a North American footprint to deliver fresher product anywhere. Earthbound Farm Organic, food to live by. Keynote sponsor, Soli. Originally known as Shenandoah Growers, Soli Organic is now America's leading grower of fresh organic culinary herbs, providing sustainable organic greens and produce to retailers coast to coast. The name Soli is derived from the Latin word for soil, because soil is where great flavor begins, and we are the only indoor vertical grower built on soil-based technology. Soli Organic combines the best of nature with the latest technology to ensure more and more people can enjoy the freshest, healthiest, most affordable organic produce possible. Soli Organic, where flavor grows. We are always asking who are the people in the community and what do they want from us? It's really about creating that treasure hunt for our customers and then flexing the sections based upon what they want. Seamless and effortless. It's the goal for any great shopping experience. And John Ruane's best in class team at the Giant Company lives that mission every day. When it comes to experience, there is nobody better. As Senior Vice President and Omni Channel Merchandising Officer, Ruane began his grocery career at age 14. Since then, he has worked his way up the ranks at Pathmark. Joined the Ajo Del Hayes family of brands as sales vice president of Stop and Shop, and then as senior vice president of Fresh for Ajo USA, where he oversaw all fresh merchandising and supply chain operations for more than 800 stores. His world revolves around a customer centric strategy, and he is here to tell you how to get it. Please welcome John Ruane. Good morning, California. That's coming from a Jersey guy. Actually, Pennsylvania for the last 10 years, but great to be here. See you all in person. Saw some really uh, familiar faces. Really nice to see. So I want to I want to talk to you today about the omni-channel evolution, and uh, don't want to scare you at all. I, but I want you to think a lot about it. So one of the things that I thought about would be: Do you see the omni-channel evolution as a crisis? Does anybody see it as a crisis? Show of hands. Nobody. OK. So if you look in this photograph here, or the slide, one of our customers, you see she's holding her Blackberry. <laughs> and on her Blackberry, she's placing an order. Oh, that's an iPhone, sorry. Uh, things, sometimes little things come and start to change the world. And sometimes they're big and bold, and sometimes they just happen slowly. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit today about that word crisis for a second. If you look that word up in Mandarin, it actually has two definitions. One of the definitions is really about danger, and one of the definitions is about opportunity. So I'm going to try to focus more on the opportunity piece. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, other than you saw on the, the video there. But I, uh, I'm from New Jersey, as I said. I grew up there, second of four kids. Uh, my parents were immigrants who came here in the 50s and uh, with nothing, pretty much. But believed that America was the greatest country in the world, as I do. And really believed that hard work and education, you could do anything you want to do. So to, to some degree, that's actually uh, worked very well for me. Hopefully it will for my kids as well, as, as we think about the future. So I started the day I turned 14 on my birthday. I went to the local supermarket and spoke to the owner. It was a one-man owner. And he, uh, he hired me on the spot, uh, which I was really proud to, to be there. And I worked there pretty much all through high school, college, worked every department in the store. It was probably my favorite was probably carts or bagging, which I think was probably my best skill so far in my career. I um, was really good at that. Uh, worked my way through high school and college, went to Rutgers, Rutgers College, Rutgers University. And I was really intent on being a physician. Uh, took a lot of the courses pre-med, had, had pre good grades. 387, who's counting? Uh, goofed off a little bit, I would have had a 4 0. But uh, really was intent on doing that. But I had something about retail that I really loved. So after I graduated, I went and worked for a company, Pathmark, which was really an innovator at the time 24 hour stores, super centers, uh, and really got intrigued with the pace of retail, loved retail. So I kept saying, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back to, to, to go to med school. And I never did, I really got pulled into it. Just to give you an idea of what retail was like back then, the store that I worked in was about 60,000 square feet, so pretty much the size of a store you typically shop in, that did a million dollars a week back then with a $1 AIV, average item value, which today would have been a $3.25 million unit. So that's how busy stores used to be when supermarkets were the only choice. That's really before there were Walmarts, before there were Targets, before there was omni-channel merchandising. There was supermarkets, and it was really exciting. Loved it every day. Started out part-time, worked my way up, left the company as a senior vice president of merchandising, went to work for a couple other companies, and most recently had my dream job here as a chief merchandising and commercial officer for the giant company which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So I'll talk a little bit about my company. So we have about just under 200 stores, a very nice company, but this was our first store. And this is actually in the town that we do business. Actually, I drive past this every day. It's, not, it's no longer a meat market, but it is the physical plant of that store is still there. And, and I, what, one of the things I'd like to, to impress on you was I grew up in the, in the 70s, basically, and when I was a kid, you could go to the local butcher, you could go to the local seafood department, you could go to the local produce stand. They still were there. And, they, and over time, they got phased out as, as retail got bigger and bigger. So for the first 50 years, this was 1922, the first 50 years, not a lot really changed. Big, big things that changed were like things like shopping carts were added in 1937. You know, that was a big, that was big innovation back then. Something else that was a big innovation was the, the bar code on product. 1952, 1952, wasn't really used for 25 years until scanners started going into stores in the 70s. So all that information existed out there. In the 60s, we started to see the big box stores, which today would be small box stores, but the 40 to 50,000 square foot stores that held about, uh, uh, going from like 15,000 up to 40 or 50,000 was a huge, three times as much. The old stores carried 4,000 items. The, the newer stores carried 40,000 items. So it was a 10X in a larger footprint. And then we saw e-commerce really peaked up a little bit. In 1989, a company called Peapod out of Chicago, I believe, was one of the first companies that really started on this delivery process. Um, so that was 1989. Later, the company that I worked for, the parent company, purchased that company. It's now called Peapod Digital Labs. 
Um, but one of the things that to really bring out there was technology started to kick in. Data became so much more important. And it really is all about the data, knowing who the customer is and moving that forward. We leveraged the power of the UPCs through CAO in the 1980s and really got to know what was going on a lot better with our customers. So at the giant company, we really believe in fresh thinking. Uh, we build our stores really, quite honestly, around the produce department. It's the most important department. Our customers tell us that. We know that. That's what builds loyalty for our customers. I showed a couple examples here. This is all Philadelphia, and they're all pretty recent additions to the family. We have the one on the left there is Riverwalk, which is a beautiful store built into a high-rise uh, condominium building. It's about 600 units available. If anybody wants one, I could cut you in on a deal. <laughs> it's not our building, actually. Uh, but very exciting. Second floor operation. You walk into a huge, gorgeous produce department. We have tons of meal solutions. We have an indoor and outdoor seating area. With both of them have tap walls, so you can get a beer outside or inside. What's better than that? Uh, and we have expanded meal solutions, which we know our customers are looking for. So, so that store is doing great. We have an heirloom model, which is an urban, smaller, urban format, upscale model that we're really targeting neighborhoods uh, that customers are looking to, to be able to do, do transactions on a daily basis and really get in and out of there. And this other one this is a sign. This was, you saw a little bit in that intro video, the robotics. This is a robotic fulfillment center that operates uh, in Philadelphia down by the airport, something that we opened pretty recently. So a lot of stuff going on. So everything old is new again, but not quite. Some of the best ideas really never go away. They just keep coming back. But every time they come back, they're just a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper. And that's how this, that's how this game works. Customer always today needs to save time. We see that every day. Customers are looking for solutions. They always wanted to save money. They definitely want to save time. So how do we make their lives just a little bit easier? So innovation doesn't mean evolution until now. We have so many ways that we could connect with our customers, and a lot of the retail, great retailers in the room here today buy some of, the, some of the best in the world from an e-commerce perspective are here as well. But we have so many ways to connect with our customers, uh, but it's kind of invisible for them. So if you're getting a delivered product, it could be coming from a robotic fulfillment center. It could be coming from a manual pick fulfillment center, which is usually a dark store. It could be coming from a ware room, which is usually contained in, in a part of our store, has about eight to 10,000 items, and they shop the rest of the store for that. We have a very robust, what we call click and collect, where we have shoppers that work for us who, who will shop your order. We have lockers, we have a B2B program, and we have some really robust third-party relationships with like Instacart is one example, that, a really good partner for us, doing a great job. But it comes down to it's all about the connections. It's really all about the connections. When I think of, of the word connections, I like the word relationship better. Uh, it seems to feel better. So if you're thinking of your friends, your colleagues, your family, um, the people you do business with, people you will do business with, it really comes down to, is there a trust? Do you, do you trust each other? Can I count on you? Are you, are you, gonna, are you gonna do what you say you, you're gonna do? Are you gonna deliver? So really what's changed in this whole connection thing is really the how and the when. So this slide really talks to um, how we try to think about the business at, at the giant company. So if you think of a single channel, it's kind of what it used to be. I think about groceries, I want to go shopping, I think about my local store, uh, and, and I go there. Now, we know that customers usually have a couple stores they like to shop. But it really is that one-to-one -one relationship of, I need something, I'm going to a store to get it. You start to think about multi-channel. So multi-channel really brings in how you can shop. So you think about how you can shop, there's different ways to do that. One of them is you can use your Blackberry, oh, it's an iPhone, you can use your, you can use your phone. 70% of transactions are going through that right now. About 25% are going through laptops or home computers and the rest are going through tablets, et cetera. And then you start to think about cross-channeling. So, so what does that mean? It means, okay, I know what I need. I have different life events. I have different demand moments, as we say. 
And you think about my regular shopping. I have people coming over for a barbecue. I have a graduation schedule. So now you, have to, you start thinking about how do I want the products to come to me? Do I want to pick them up? Do I want them delivered, et cetera? And then you start to really, the evolution becomes this blur. The blur becomes starting to think about what do I want, how do I want it, and how do I get it? So you're really thinking about, you're not consciously putting all this through your brain, but you're thinking about, okay, here's what we need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So what are we doing? The goal is to make it a little bit easier for our customers. And we know that customers are looking for that. So as I said, everything old is new again. So here we go. 1894, an ingenious idea. 1894, long time ago. Uh, Sears was the largest retailer, and they came up with the idea of this unlimited assortment. Unlimited assortment, all these things that people never saw before. Prices they never saw before, quality they never saw before. Did you know that in 1900, the average American traveled 340 miles per year? So that's less than a mile a day. So they were in the same areas, back and forth, locally, locally. They didn't see a lot. They saw Joe the Butcher. They saw Sal the, the produce guy. They didn't see a lot. By 2019, that, that went up to 16,000 miles. And I think the illusion here is that people travel a lot more and see different things. But I think what's even more powerful than that is what they see on their, on their phones and, and their laptops. So it became more about prices became more important, quality became more important, and the take it or leave it, here's what we have for you, kind of goes away. So who would have thought that a company as ingenious as this, by 1989, 95 years later, would have slipped from the number one retail position to number two to Walmart, and by 125 years later, would be out of business. So today's catalog, pretty robust. Amazon Prime Day, who made a purchase? All right, write these names down. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, I saw the number today. They, it was kind of funny how they, they called it out. 300 million items sold. Savings of $1.7 billion to consumers, so they're not really telling you the whole story there, but it's still a lot of items. I saw one thing that said 100,000 items were selling a minute, which is pr pretty damn good. So from today's catalog, Amazon, obviously number one in the world. Talked a little bit about Instacart, a third-party fulfillment. GoPuff, uh, I have six kids, not kids anymore, 21 to 30, I saw GoPuff on, on my daughter's American Express card, my American Express card. <laughs> I was thinking, now she's smoking too? What's up, what's up with this? Uber Eats as well, another favorite for the younger people. The, the three, Target, Walmart, Costco, probably three of the best, uh, top, 10, top 10 in the world, really great at what they do. So the point here would be, uh, we have some really great US companies doing a big, big job here. Obviously, uh, Walmart's made huge investments, as well as others, uh, Target as well. But you've got to also remember that out of the top 10 e-commerce companies in the world, over half of them are from Asia as well. Uh, China, Japan, South Korea, India. And if you think about that, there's, there's such a large population, such a large demand there. By the way, 55% of, of Chinese customers have made food purchases online, which is far higher than US, the US, and maybe a good predictor about what we see there. A Couple other things that you need to know about businesses like delivery or Instacart, we see a few things. We see two factors. One would be where price, where price is less sensitive. People are less sensitive, they have some more disposable income. The other dynamic that really pops to the top would be in city environments, if you think about it, if you don't have transportation in a city environment, it's really a pain try to get to the store, take in mass transit, and take the bags home. So a lot of people are using this service to really get that done. So we think about the omni-channel evolution. I want to impress upon you the, po the power of what's in your pocket, whether it's a smartphone or an iPhone. So 15 years ago last week was the creation of the iPhone. At that creation that was the demise of the BlackBerry, they just didn't know it. The iPhone has a million times more computing power than all of the technology that was used to send men to the moon in 1969, which is kind of crazy. Now, I don't think we're necessarily using all that yet, but it's gonna come. So what does that mean for you? Today, or yesterday, if 
you did business with us, maybe you get an ad. If you get an ad, we're going to give you a price point. We're going to put you in the, in the flyer. We're going to give you a display. We're going to give you an allocation. We'll give you a sign. Tomorrow, we'll also put you on our e-commerce platform. What you're going to see there, you're going to see things. You're going to see the customer's purchase history, which is very important. You're going to, see this, you're going to want the search terms, because when people type in strawberries, you want them to type, they want your brand to come up first. You're going to be interested in things like click-through rates. Are you being able to get to the customer? We've seen on um, some more difficult categories like home meal replacement as one example or some of the bundling things we've done. Where we do this well, we have 300% increase in what we do. Uh, our landing pages will tell the story about your brand, the history of your brand, the legacy of your company, your heritage. And there's a lot of financial calculations that I won't bore you with around customer acquisition and other things we look at like revenue per thousand. Uh, that will be other measures that you'd want to know about. Omnichannel customers are very important. Twice as much spending than a typical brick customer, an in-store customer. One and a half times more on trip frequency. One and a half times more uh, spend per trip. So this is a total win. This is on omnichannel customers. And what's even more important to this group here is that organic produce customers, it even indexes higher. 230% index on the spend versus stores, 180 on the frequency versus stores, 200 on the spend per trip versus stores. So the good news is customers like, omni-channel customers like produce and they like organic produce. The bad news is if you're not involved in this, you could be losing out. So the categories that really stand out, mentioned natural, organics, right at the top of the list, produce, packaged meats and seafood, by the way, we used to hear, I don't use delivery or I don't have use the click and collect business because I want to pick up my own produce. I want to pick up my own meat. That's gone. People don't say that anymore or they say it a lot less often. Other categories like frozen, plant-based, baby, household, meal prep, they all pop to the top of the list. Brands that stand out. You saw a bunch of them here today. These are some of the brands at my company that stand out. I won't read them all to you. You see them. You're, hopefully, your brand is up there. These are, when we spoke to the team, Dave Lassard's my head of fresh, he's here. I said, who's doing it best? You know, who's doing it best? And he, and he called these out. And then on the center store side, General Mills, Kellogg's, Chobani, P&G. P&G probably led the way here. They have a lot of ideas around how to drive this business. So we're set for amazing growth, all right? We have increased our business in two years, about 350% in these, in these categories. We have plans by 2025 to double that, so that's seven, 700% increase from where we were. So the keys to success, what do you need to do to wrap your head around this? First thing is, you gotta understand where you are and where you wanna go. One word of caution would be, if you're, if you're not moving at all, you don't wanna go to 1,000 miles an hour. You wanna, you wanna jump in, figure it out a bite at a time, get, understand the language, understand how this works. You gotta train your teams on how to negotiate and talk to either retailers or if you're a supplier, et cetera, how to, how to speak the language and really understand and measure results. And, and probably the most important part of our business that hasn't changed, it's about having strategic relationships with your vendor partners. That's how this business works, particularly the produce business, which is an unbelievable business. So what I say is it really comes down to experience. Customers have an expectation. They know what they want, and then they measure it, an experience that they have. And when, you, when that number is greater than one, you're winning, and you're going to win. You know, the, the, the good news here is that this is a great customer. An opportunity would be 93% of these customers expect a better experience than what they're getting. So with that, I want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, appreciate being here, appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Hopefully I brought you a little bit of value and uh, I want to say thank you to the American farmers for stepping up and standing out for the last couple of years, really making things happen. Very amazing. <laughs> last, last word would be, is e-commerce a crisis for you? Maybe you're thinking about that just slightly differently. Is it going to be a danger or an opportunity? For me, it's an opportunity. Thank you.